So as I just said, the goal for this module is to better understand climate forward and energy efficiency strategies and technologies that, when deployed in your home, business, or church, can produce energy savings and a reduction of a building's greenhouse gas emissions. The topics we're going to cover today, and they're not exhaustive, but we're going to cover lighting, water heating, HVAC, insulation, appliances, greenscaping, and behavior, which is an often overlooked element. Uh, the big deep dives are going to be in lighting, water heating, and HVAC. My plan, uh, I don't know how long this will last. Uh, we have two hours. We have now one hour and 45 minutes. My hope is that maybe at the hour mark we take a 10 minute break and then we, we wrap up with some other, uh, some more of these topics here. <clears throat> so how did I get started? In 2013, 2014, we bought our first two houses. I wasn't married at the time. I bought a house in Charlotte. My wife who's now my wife bought a house in Asheville. And I bought the house in Charlotte because there was something called the Great Recession. And as you might remember, home prices were very depressed, especially in Charlotte, which was a large banking center. So I scooped up a house that was a foreclosure for pretty cheap, had good bones on it, um, and bought a house essentially for my mother to live in. So my mom lives in Charlotte, I've always lived in, in Asheville. Um, and so we have been making changes to both of those houses through time and we moved to Waynesville in 2019. This is our home in Asheville. Uh, it's still our home in Asheville, we, we now rent it. But we moved into the house in 2013, and by 2019, six years later, that house was finally net zero. It took a long time. And we didn't sacrifice, we didn't just eat rice and beans and not go on trips to make things happen. We did the things we wanted to do, but we, we put in a budget to make little improvements on a year-by-year -year basis, and that's the way I kind of framed it. My wife would say, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to do, just let me know and we'll make it happen. So, and, and this is driven by, this was not initially driven by environment, I want you to know that. It was initially driven by cost savings. In 2002, 2013, 2014, I had not read a lot of books on the environment or environmentalism and decarbonization, like many Americans. This is well, this is eight years ago. So for me, it started out from the basis of trying to save money because there's one thing that I absolutely hate with a capital H, and it's recurring cost. I'm a nurse, I work at a hospital, I work by the hour. I cannot make any more money than just working, but I can reduce my cost to give myself more disposable income, and that was my goal. So getting electric bills at 200 and gas bills at $200 every month was a drag. So I started looking for ways to make changes. And interestingly, that they're often vilified, a really great website, if Duke is your provider, is Duke Energy. They have a Super Savers or something website and a different web pages you can go on and they will give you tools, they will give discounts, uh, their rebate programs. And so I started looking at the Duke stuff. So just, just briefly though, this is our home. It now it has solar panels on it. We have a, a, a high efficiency heat pump with air handler and everything in the house is Wi-Fi directed. We have a heat pump water heater, LED lights. There is no part of the house that's not efficient. We re-insulated, we put in doors and windows where we could. It was a 1967 ranch house that had had very little improvements. Also, you can probably see a car charger. We had a level two uh, car charger installed for our plug-in hybrid. All right, so let's move on. Let's start with lighting. So the traditional kind of light bulb is an incandescent light bulb, right? It's been around for 100 years. It's Edison's light bulb. And it, for the longest time, was the only light bulb you could put in your house. And I remember as a kid, the light would blow, and we'd have to change lamps, and I'd get in it, it was hot, and you'd touch it. And the reason it was so hot all the time is because 90% of the energy and a light bulb was lost due to heat. It was there to do one thing, and that's create light, but 90% of the energy was wasted in heat. Especially undesirable if you live in Wilmington like I did, and it's hot. So you're essentially cooling your house, but you're heating it up with light. Um, so the incandescent light bulb kind of comes, and so is it responsible for, at, at one point in time, if you looked at a pie graph of home energy usage, Lighting in a home would account for 17 to 20 percent of the cost. That's no longer true today if you have CFLs or LEDs. Um, so, 
The Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 created a new standard for light bulbs requiring a 27% reduction in wattage. And of course, like everything in Congress, they're lobbyists and they're half measures. And basically, incandescent bulbs got a pass to be a little more efficient than they were, but they were still allowed to be produced. And incandescent light bulbs are terrible because they use still so much more energy than LEDs. Okay, enter the CFL, which stands for Compact Fluorescent Light Bulb. Many of you might remember these from the late 90s, 2000s, which some people call the swirly light bulbs. And they were pretty great for a brief time because they produced, uh, they were five times more efficient than the original incandescent bulbs. You could touch them, they were hot. Uh, but they had some drawbacks to them. One was the shape of them. If you put them in a lamp, you would sometimes find that you couldn't get the lamp shade down. If they were outside, it took a long time to come on. So if you let the dogs out, it would just kind of warm up very slowly. And at the time, they cost a lot more than incandescent bulbs. Uh, but the biggest drawback to this technology is that mercury is in those bulbs. And mercury is a heavy metal, and I don't mean the music genre. My wife hates that thing. <laughs> different, different, different musical tastes. And so, um, mercury contains a heavy metal. Why is that bad? Can anybody, and Steve Wall's not in the room, so that's good. Can anybody tell me who that's a picture of? Any guesses? Well, that's Ilya Repin's uh, depiction of Ivan the Terrible after he has bludgeoned his only son and heir to the throne to death. It's a very gross picture. Um, the reason I showed that is because Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny, as he's called in Russian, was treated by his physicians of the time with mercury. And mercury causes madness. But specifically, according to the CDC, mercury can cause mood swings, irritability, tremors, insomnia, changes in nerve response, weakness, muscle atrophy, lack of coordination, impaired speech, hearing, and walking. And that's bad, because <laughs> what happens when these bulbs go out is that people take them and they undo them, they put them in the trash. And when they put them in the trash, they go to the landfill. When they go to the landfill, they get squished, and then the mercury leaches into potentially the groundwater. And that's bad. Not to mention if one happened to break, and they would break pretty easily, you just sweep it up. You wouldn't think there was anything toxic about the CFL. So, you know, movement is then afoot within the government to kind of say, well, we can't have all these CFLs everywhere, so we're going to start to retire those, and they are going to be fully retired here shortly. But um, fortunately, what comes along is the gold standard in lighting, which is the LED, which stands for light emitting diode. Uh, it uses a semiconductor to electroluminesce when a current passes through it. It is very elegant and it's awesome. It comes on instantaneously. And importantly, it uses 35% or so less energy than a CFL. Now, the reason this stuff is important is because I've had conversations with people through the years. I could give away light bulbs and people would say, good, when mine goes out, I'll replace it. The thing about LEDs is they're so efficient, they should be replaced immediately in every light socket in a house, inside and out. LEDs are available, you can go to Lowe's, Home Depot, wherever, and you'll see almost a whole aisle of light bulb options. And I would submit that this is the lowest of all possible hanging fruit. It's, the, it's something you can do yourself. You just go to Lowe's, you buy light bulbs, you go home, you get a ladder, you practice ladder safety, and you put in the light bulbs. But what you will discover in doing that, if you change them all out, not just the ones that are commonly used, really go through your home, what should be done is to go through a home, create an inventory of every lamp, every kind of, every kind of light bulb, because they're different, right? You might have some that are underneath uh, the range hood that are different. The ones outside might be different. You might have recessed lighting, which would be our 30s. So you want to make an inventory of your light bulbs, and then go to Lowe's and spend what effectively would be $100, $150, and you will get your money back within a year probably, right? Behavior changes the actual return on investment. But they're so efficient that all the other kinds of light bulbs should be exchanged. If you currently have CFLs in your home, 
what you should do when you exchange those out is to take them, put them in a nice plastic bag, and take them to Lowe's. Lowe's is authorized to dispose of those light bulbs. Very few places are them, so they don't go in the trash. Uh, with incandescent light bulbs, those should be retired as well. There are all kinds of um, equivalent wattages of LEDs. In our home, we have a lot of 40 watt equivalents and 60 watt equivalents. Uh, what that means is this bulb, if it were a 60 watt equivalent, would use eight and a half watts to produce the same amount of light as a traditional incandescent 60 watt bulb. If it's a 40 watt bulb, it would use five and a half watts. Now the bulbs today, admittedly, are not quite as good as they were, say, 10 years ago. And the reason for that is this. Um, these light bulb makers were making light bulbs that would last, in some cases, 30 years. And what happens when you make a light bulb that lasts 30 years? You put yourself out of business. So they dialed it back a little bit. And what you'll see nowadays, if you look at the, 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 the label on the box, and the LEDs, that they may last somewhere between seven to 13 years. But still, that's a long time, and it's much longer than an incandescent bulb or a CFL. Now, so some other advantages to LEDs, longer light, shock resistant, cool to the touch. As we're talking about these different technologies, also be thinking about ways that you might help participate in the community. One of the things I think about when I think of LED light bulbs are Boy Scout troops or youth groups. These are opportunities to go out into a community and to say, an Eagle Scout project. I'm gonna take over this whole block, I'm gonna knock on doors, and we're gonna go in in a blitzkrieg kind of fashion for five to 10 minutes and send a bunch of scouts in to replace bulbs in a home. That's something that could be done, and that would help bring energy efficiency to more people in the community. So start, just think about ways that you might participate uh, from, from other things that you're engaged in. Okay, so a few rule changes and savings. Uh, information. The U.S. Department of Energy is banning incandescent bulbs in 2023. The Department of Energy estimates $3 billion a year saved for the U.S. customers and will reduce carbon emissions by 220 million metric tons of carbon over 30 years. So in 2020, 50% of all households, of households report using most or all LED for indoor lighting compared to 2015 was only 4%. So clearly there's been uptake and adoption of LEDs, but I'm also suspicious that I doubt there are many households that have all LEDs, right? So getting all the way there is important. And again, it's just one of the cheapest things you can possibly do. Here's a cost comparison. Um, and at the bottom there, I see, I made some assumptions, which are also often made by manufacturers when they put in uh, information, so that it's apples and apples. Uh, they estimate three hours of use a day, 365 days a year. And then if you've just replaced uh, 30 bulbs in a household, this is the amount of savings. So $246 a year saved by using LEDs uh, for a $200. $15 a year or so saved by using LEDs versus other technology. So that's it for uh, the lighting department. We'll move on to water heating. True or false, there is no such thing as a hot water heater. It's true. It's true because you don't need to heat hot water. <laughs> but Home Depot doesn't have that, so they have a little thing you can shop that says hot water heater. So it's just it's just something we live with. But in fact, <laughs> there is no such thing as a hot water heater. Okay, water heating. So if lighting is the easiest thing to do, water heating might be the most overlooked thing in a household. And the reason for that is in the course of any year, water heating is probably your second biggest energy expense. So who has a water heater in their living room? <laughs> Anybody? What about, I mean, no one puts, you know, white strings around it and decorates it for Christmas so that everybody can see it? No. A water heater is the most despised appliance in a household. You don't show it off to anybody, you know? You show off your, you know, wolf range to people. You don't show off a water heater. Water heaters are often in closets, they're in utility spaces, crawl spaces. They're the black sheep. They just need to do work, but no one wants to look at them. 
And the reason I bring that up is because if it's out of sight, it's often out of mind. And water heating is a huge expense for households. So up here, let's see. Yeah, according to Energy Star, water heating. So up here, this is an example of the energy guide, which is a sort of yellow sticker. You see it on all appliances. It's required by law. So slapped on the side of the water heater is an energy guide. And for this particular 50-gallon uh, water heater, it uses $424 a year of electricity on average. Now, that's a more recent electric water heater. If you had an electric water heater 10, 15 years ago, it would not be under the new standard, which requires more insulation, so it would be more inefficient. We had one of those in our house in Asheville, and the sticker on the side of it said $550 a year. That really bugged me. I'd get under the house in the crawl space, and I'd look at it, and it dawned on me that before I ever plugged in an iPhone or flipped on a light switch or anything else, we were paying, with tax, about $50 a month just to heat water. So I looked at that and realized that that was a real opportunity to change it out. Um, there are five frequently used types of water heaters. I'm not going to talk about solar, putting in you know, glycol and all that other stuff. We're going to talk about gas tank storage, electric tank storage, gas tankless, also known as on-demand, electric tankless on-demand, and then the heat pump, which is also called hybrid. Okay, so gas tank. Uh, gas water heater is very common especially with access, and that's how I cost out lower cost of natural gas. Mm -hmm. You know, prices of natural gas, propane, much higher than they used to be, thanks to inflation, war with Russia, geopolitics, other issues. Um, so the prices are very, are very volatile. Um, and it, the way it installs, just if you have one of these, you know, it's vented, it has to be vented, so it's either vented out the side or the top of the house. And it can use either natural gas or propane. Full disclosure, our house in Waynesville uses propane. I hate it. We have a heat pump water heater that's sitting in our crawl space, and as soon as I get the electric panel redone, we're going to put it in. But I've had it for two years, and it just sits in a box. And meanwhile, we pay for propane. And it costs us about $800 a year to heat water. And I hate that, as I mentioned. So we're, gonna, we're making changes, but again, it's a process. The fatal flaw for a gas tank storage system is that it uses fossil fuels. That's very important. With all the technology we're going to talk about, HVAC and water heating, using fossil fuels at home is no bueno. And the reason for that is because if we want to decarbonize the grid, if we're asking the Duke Energies of the world to put solar panels and offshore wind up, what good does it matter if your own house is still using fossil fuels? And that's also important because the life of these systems typically is, they're fairly long-lived systems. You know, water heater, it might have a warranty for six to 10 years, but more than likely it's gonna last a good 15 years. With HVAC, the same story, 15, 20 years, you're hoping to get out of the system. So fossil fuels, I'm not an advocate for using these. I will not say there is not a use case scenario where these technologies don't apply. If you live up on a ridge and the electric company forgets about you and you have two weeks, multiple times a year where you don't have power, that might be a use case. However, I would also argue you could put in solar and batteries and also avoid that. But, so I'm, I'm hanging on it, but not entirely. Okay, tankless gas water heating is cheaper. And what, what this technology is, is consider a tank, it's just this body of water that you're keeping at 120 degrees, 365 days a year. It takes a lot of energy to do that, whether you use electricity or you use gas. And it sits there, it's reliable, right? It's this black sheep, it just sits there and it produces hot water all the time for you, but it keeps it in a tank and it's not super efficient. The tankless kind uses a strong burst of gas or a strong burst of electricity to essentially create on-demand or instantaneous hot water. It has a few advantages. Um, one of the advantages is um, you theoretically have an almost unlimited supply of hot water when you don't have that in a tank. My uncle was a plumber, and we have come from a family of plumbers. My uncle's a plumber, and he'd always say things to me that just sounded odd. Like he'd say, you know, he'd always brag on whatever new technology came out. So he installed one of these, and he said, I can go to the beach for three hours and come back and still have hot water. Like he'd turn on the hot water, go to the beach for three hours, come back and still have hot water. I was like, why would you ever do that? <laughs> He would also brag on toilets and say, this toilet will flush a bucket of golf balls. <laughs> That's great, but why would you ever want to flush a bucket of golf balls? 
<laughs> okay, moving on to tankless electric water here. So we just established that on demand, you create hot water almost instantaneously using a strong burst of energy to create it. So the biggest drawback to a tankless water heater uh, that's electric, and people will put these in because they'll say, oh, I want an you know, electric water heater, and they'll go in this direction. The biggest drawback here is the sheer amount of energy that it draws to do it to start with. So, for instance, in this example here, this Ream example, this is a, one of their electric uh, on-demand water heaters. It will take 40, uh, excuse me, four 40 amp 5 volt breakers. So that's going to require 160 amps in an electric field. Okay, now think about it. Older homes might have a 100 amp service. Newer homes probably have a 200 amp service. Most homes don't have much beyond a 200 amp service. 300 amps, 400 amps are just not that common. So if you put one of these in there, even if it's 120, you're taking up space in a panel and you are foreclosing on additional opportunities in that panel over time. So for instance, electric vehicle charging, solar, Right? You're going to have to be able to plug into a panel. The last thing that you're going to want to do is to have to, because you've done this, is go out and get a 400 amp service because it's going to cost a lot of money. It's adding unnecessary dollars. Not only that, they're fairly expensive to install. Because um, typically, you know, everyone already has water heating. So the question is, how are you replacing it? How much does it cost to replace what you have? If you have electric, you're not likely to go to gas. If you have gas, you're likely to stay with gas, et cetera. So if you go in a tankless route, the gas is fairly easily changed over, but the electric part requires a much bigger upgrade. And it can cost thousands of dollars. So all of these have flaws. And now I want to show you the gold standard. So a heat pump water heater or a hybrid water heater is the gold standard. And it is electric. And it uses heat pump technology. So it takes in warm air from a room, and it just charges cold air. And what it does is it heats the water. It's very efficient. In fact, it's so efficient that instead of costing $450 a year, $300 something a year, it only costs $110 to $114 a year to operate. And the Ream one costs $110, and I believe there's an A.O. Smith at Lowe's that costs $114 a year to operate. Also, instead of a five to six year warranty, they come with a 10 year warranty. And they tend to pay for themselves quickly. This is truer before manufacturers were looking at inflation and then they started to sort of make things up like, hey, it's going to cost a lot more uh, because of our supply chain stuff, whenever they're just building the pump. Um, so prices right now, clearly the main numbers just came out with 8.6% inflation. So there's a lot of craziness going on in the market. So always, if you're shopping for something, compare things. Um, the great thing about a heat pump water heater is if you have a tank system that's electric, it's the same hookup. It's the same 240 going to a panel. So you hook it up the same, which is really nice. Now, there are a few, and you also, if you have Duke Energy, there, there is a rebate that's, uh, that you can file with Duke Energy. The way this works is you get their Smart Saver program, and you have to pick a particular installer and then the particular installer will come to your house, give you an estimate, fill out the rebate paperwork, and send it back to Duke. It's a bit laborious. Duke used to have a, pro a program that was point of sale. So you could go in to Home Depot, scan the, bar the QR code on the, on the beam, and then go to the register and get $350 off of the register. But that worked too well. <laughs> and maybe it wasn't being used, because right, I've got a heat pump water heater that I took advantage of that, and it's sitting in my crawl in our basement in Waynesville, so it's not actually in operation yet. So the plan, the, the system they have now is you have to go through one of their required installers. Mm -hmm. And who's to say that the required installer doesn't just add more to the price because you're picking from so few installers? I don't know. Um, a heat pump water heater costs about today $1,700 for a 50 gallon water heater at Home Depot. So there are a few caveats about a heat pump water heater that I want you to understand. And that is, for a 50 gallon equivalent, it requires 700 cubic feet of air because it's a heat pump, right? It's gotta have access to some kind of ambient air. It can't just keep taking a hot air and discharging cold air in a confined space. So 700 cubic feet of space is what's needed. I'll tell you what we did in Nashville. We had a, a, a low boy in our crawl space 
big fat thing, said $550 a year on it. We got with our electrician, bought a heat pump water heater, and we stubbed up into the house, put it in a closet in a spare bedroom, still had space in the closet, and then because we had doors that were solid, we had to take off those doors and put on louver doors. That way it could exchange air into the bedroom. Um, another thing about heat pump, so in the summer that's really great, because basically you have free air conditioning. I would get home as a nurse, I always take a shower when I get home from my shift. I get home, take a shower, deplete the water heater of hot water, go into the bedroom, the spare bedroom to sleep, and the, and the water heater kicks on and creates air conditioning. So I didn't have to actually, you know, turn on the air conditioning for the whole house. I could turn it up some and just have air conditioning in that room. So that's really neat. When it doesn't work so well is winter. So in winter, you either just have to make that understand that that particular room is going to be colder, or you can duct out of the house itself, and that requires a little bit of modification. You can have the AC in the summer and discharge out in the winter. So return on investment metrics, I'm a big believer in return on investment. Everything you do should have the highest return on investment and then you go down from there. Um, a tanked water heater, a tanked electric, so your typical white, ugly water heater that's sitting somewhere in the house. These are just costs that I pulled off of Home Depot's website. And there's the annual operating costs as listed by the energy guide. There are differences with every model, so I just picked some randomly, that would use about a 50 gallon equivalent. So as you can see there, the return on investment for a heat pump is less than four years for an electric. For natural gas, it's a little less than five years because natural gas tank is uh, more uh, efficient. And then for tank propane, less than three years. So that's pretty awesome because your heat pump water heater should last a good long time. It might, it's warranty for 10 years, maybe it lasts 15 years. So you start to see savings there immediately. And the reason that's important, the reason it's important to have LEDs, the reason it's important to have HVAC that's efficient, the reason it's important to have efficient water heating is because, let's say you're considering solar. Solar is still the most expensive thing you can do to your home, right? Solar announces to, it's garish, right? Solar's garish, it's like it announces to the world that you're energy efficient, or it, that you care about the environment, that you, it just lets all your neighbors know that you've got solar. They're not going to know if you have a heat pump water heater, but solar makes a statement. But the problem therein lies that there's only so much real estate on a roof. There's shading. There's weird roof designs. There's uh, limitations of real estate where it's not facing east or west or due south. Right? So you have limited real estate, and it costs more. So if you can get all of your energy load in the house down as small as you can get it, then solar's cheaper because what you're offsetting is much less. Okay, it is 45 minutes into it. I'm gonna do HVAC and then we'll take a break for about 10 minutes. Heating, HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. That is a picture of our beautiful green HP20 heat pump in our actual home. Uh, it is super efficient, super efficient. It has inverter technology, has an air hand connects to an air handler inside. It is ducted like most systems are. Uh, you know, if any of you are considering changing your HVAC, please get a lot of estimates. We got estimates on that for twenty-two thousand dollars. We had it installed for eighty-five hundred, and they did all the duct work. The, the other guys did all the duct work. So sometimes mom and pop may be better than big giant, um, you know, companies. It just depends. Okay, so in terms of your pie chart, right, in terms of the energy load in your household and where the biggest slice is, it's definitely HVAC, and you already know this, because in the, in the spring and the fall, your energy bills typically are lower. In the winter and summer, especially here in the winter, in Wilmington in the summer, the, the energy demand spikes, and it does so because of the HVAC. So electric bills, um, much higher during summer and winter. Uh, heat, elect, so cooling is, is almost exclusively is exclusively done by electricity, right? But the heating part can be different. So heating can rely on a, a heat pump, which just turns one way to cool your house, it turns the other way to warm your house, it has an air handler inside, it also has backup strips, usually like a 10 kW uh, strips in there, in order a coil, in order to blow air past it if it's too cold outside for the heat pump to run. That is more inefficient, but on average, you are saving money still. 
Then there's natural gas, propane, and oil. And we see a lot of these in this area. You see tanks outside of people's homes for heating oil, and the same thing is true for propane. Natural gas uh, is less available, right? Because it doesn't, you can't put it in a tank, you have to run a line. And so fewer places have that in this part of the world. Um, the challenge with heating, as you all know, I mean, it doesn't take much just to read the Mountain here or the Smoky Mountain News and hear about people writing in about how heavily burdened they are by the cost of heating. Uh, that was true this past winter, it's true the winter before, and it will be true this winter, absolutely, because of geopolitics. So, to the extent that folks can get off natural gas, propane, and heating oil, they will save money in the long run. And of course, you know, the problem with fossil fuels is again, if you're putting in a new system in your house and it's using fossil fuels, it doesn't matter what the grid does because you're still producing it here. Now people say things to me like, and they still say it, and people in the trade say this. They'll say, well, a heat pump only works down to 40 degrees or so, then you know, you need to have something like a furnace for back, or you need to have propane, or you need to have natural gas. That is not true anymore. There are cold climate heat pumps that work in North Dakota, Minnesota, the UP, and they do really well at their jobs. They cost more, a little more, uh, but installation's the same. And basically, these air source heat pumps are like what I showed you earlier. They're able to, they're, they're so efficient, they're able to extract little bits of warm air, even on a sub-freezing day, and take that and then put it into your house. And that's pretty, that's kind of marvelous. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so there's also, there's one other thing we'll talk about, and that's ground source heat pumps. We're not going to talk about it. They're awesome. Ground source heat pumps are great. Um, it's when you take a line, you run it either down to the ground several hundred feet, or you have a field where you have loops, and you fill it over. The problem with that is just, it tends to be prohibitively expensive. There are, there are companies working on making that technology less expensive, but compared to an air source heat pump right now, it's just very expensive. So uh, we had ours priced out in Nashville and it was well over $50,000. And I was like, thanks, you just convinced me not to do it. Because I can't afford to do that. And the return on investment was not good. All right, so as we talk about HVAC, how do you know that something's efficient? Fortunately, there are acronyms. Because everybody needs more acronyms in their life. <laughs> so the first one is about cooling. So if you're thinking about cooling, there's something called the Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio, or SEER number. You will see this on the side of your heat pump, unless your heat pump is ancient, it's worn off. But yeah, all of these have this. This is the one off of our house in Asheville. And you'll see there the SEER rating is 20 to 20.5. Let me tell you something, that's ridiculous. I think it's super efficient. And what makes it so efficient is it has an inverter in it, it has variable speed capacity. What that means is your typical heat pump or air conditioner outside, what does it do? It has two, it has two stages, all in all. And it just does that. It just does it, and it does it all day long, and I guess you get used to it, so you just ignore it. It does provide comfort. But that's what it does. It's all and it's off. It's full power or no power. What there are, but what makes a heat pump more efficient is different stages. Right? There are two stage heat pumps. So you might operate, say, 40% and then all the way up to 100 and then there's variable speed, which is kind of your Cadillac model, and that's what this is. And it can vary between, communicates between the heat pump, the blower, and the heat pump to change the degree of operation by as little as 1% at a time. So if I want to know if our heat pump's working in Asheville, I have to walk over to it and look at it. <clears throat> because the, the fan's running at such low speed. Now it tends to run longer, but because it's using less energy, it costs less. And because it's running more continuously. What happens with the on, off, on, off, on, off? If you're, if you're sleeping in a hot, if you go to Charleston, Wilmington, anywhere, and you're sleeping, or taking vacation, and it turns off, you wake up and you know. Because the degree, the, the, the variability, every time it turns on and off, is something like this, right? So it, it does, even though the thermostat will say 70 degrees, that's not really true. There's a temperature at which it kicks on, and that might be 73 or four, and a temperature at which it cuts off, which might be 67 or 68. And it just sort of gives you this average. So that's what it does. It turns on, it turns off. And that's uncomfortable. You realize this when you're in one of those spaces that has a single stage heat pump or air conditioner. Um, variable speed will run, and it creates this sort of degree of comfort like this. So there's very little difference in the, um, 
in the, in, in the temperature range, which creates more comfort. Not only that, it also dehumidifies the house better than a single stage. Okay. So, the minimum sear, if you're looking at one of these devices, is 14. Next year, that goes up to 15. Good. That's better. If you have a system, though, that is older, it could be 13. If you have a system that's somehow living still from the 90s, it could be a sear 10. And it's probably lost some efficiency again, so it's probably very inefficient. So making any kind of upgrade, even to a sear 15, which will be the minimum standard next year, will pay big dividends. Okay, but because you know it's not often real hot in this area, the sear number might be less important to you than the following number, which is the HSPF. Okay, so HSPF stands for Heating Seasonal Performance Factor, and this is a measure of heating efficiency. So the higher the HSPF, just like with sear, the more efficient the unit. Now this one I've circled here is 11. That's pretty stellar too. So it's doing not only the work in the summer, it's doing the work in the winter. Um, the minimum in 2023 for HSPF will increase to 8.8, or I think 8.2 now. And that's, that's just, um, that's the number that you should want. But you're not going to usually get the one number without the other number, because it's the same technology that's allowing both of those things to happen. Okay, so what type of systems exist, and which, and which should I consider replacing? HVAC. Okay. So common configurations for HVAC include a split system. This would be where you have a heat pump outside and you have a backup furnace inside, like natural gas, propane, or oil. Bad by fossil fuels. I mean, fossil fuels, that's all I'll say. Furnace only, bad fossil fuels. Air conditioner with the furnace, bad, again, fossil fuels. These systems are going to cost more to operate because of the volatility of the price of fossil fuels. So but what I'm really going to talk about here is the heat pump and air handler, which is, again, the gold standard. There's just no reason not to have that, even in cold climates. So people who live in South Dakota can have this, and people in Waynesville, North Carolina can use the same technology. And there's also kind of a moonshot right now with the Department of Energy, where they're trying to create a very low-cost, single-stage uh, heat pump that will operate in super extreme climates. And so, you know, all the big guys, train, carrier, they're all working on this together with governments or that public-private partnership to develop something because we realize that if we're going to get to where we need to be in terms of climate, we're going to have to make sure that everyone in the country can just be on electricity. Okay, of the heat pump with air handler, there's two different kinds. There's <coughs> the ducted versus the ductless mini splits. Okay, well a ducted system is just simply, you have ducts, that run from an air handler in a crawl space or in an attic, and they go out and they branch out to all of the parts of your home, usually to every room, right? You have a register there, and you get heat or you get cold. That's a ducted system. <clears throat> a ductless mini split, however, does not have ducts, as the name implies. You may have seen these, and I'll show you a picture of them, but it usually has a cassette or an air handler that sort of sits in the wall and it kind of does this little thing. You see them in the restaurants or some places. <laughs> and then what it does is it runs outside, and you have the coolant, which goes down to the condenser outside, and it's very efficient. Mitsubishi probably makes the best on the market. They have some models that will heat a room in five minutes from 50 degrees. Really quite awesome technology. Okay, so ducted heat pumps, pros and cons. The pros. You can easily replace fossil fuel heating source for ducted layouts. Um, so if you're already using ducts to heat, you can also do that with heat pumps. Um, no fossil fuels burn in the home. Um, and this is an important thing to consider too, as we consider these other modules going forward. If you have a heat pump with an air handler and you have solar, if you have a sort of a net metering regime in your utility schedule or something like it, like we're working on in Waynesville, what you will be able to do, and this is true in Waynesville, is you're going to be able to sort of take your solar production and bank it, because you're going to produce a lot more in the summer than you're going to use. And you get to use that and you fill up this bank, so to speak, of energy that you can access when you don't have as much solar and as much colder outside. That's important because that will reset. In Waynesville, that's going to reset on March 31st of every year. April 1, it will start over. So you would be encouraged then to build a system 
that's going to account for all of your winter heating needs so that you can access that bank of energy. Okay. And I said the heat pumps are much more efficient than they used to be. Okay, cons. Again, if you're that person that lives up on a ridge and the power company forgets about you for weeks at a time, if you lose power, you're out of luck, right? If you have a furnace or something, you know, it might be a better luck or you heat with wood or something else. Um, so ducted systems also uh, can heat a whole building, which may, not be, which may not be desirable at all times. Okay, so uh, case in point, our house in Waynesville, I'm only in one room at a time. Do we have to heat the whole house? You know, that's, that's arguably undesirable. The space that I really need conditioned is about two feet around me wherever I move. You know, I don't need the attic to be worn. You can turn off registers and stuff, but still. So that potentially is a disadvantage. And then also, one of the disadvantages from ducted systems, it doesn't really matter how well it's insulated because it's going through an unconditioned space, an attic or a crawl space, you're probably losing some efficiency there versus the ductless mini system. Okay, that's a ductless mini split as I was describing, right? It's got this cassette or egg handler inside, it kind of does its thing, and then outside you've got the condenser. Uh, the pros for a ductless mini splits, easily installed. You can watch, I mean, YouTube is great and bad. <laughs> but you can watch YouTube videos and watch guys install these things and not even have to watch time lapse stuff. But this this old house, that's that's a program I can get behind, right? And they'll have little segments where you can learn how to do stuff. Um, so the good thing about this is they're easily installed where no previous ducts exist. So say it's an old house in Hazelwood. Several of those have been remodeled lately and I ride my bike around and I say, oh, ductless mini splits, because they didn't have ducts to start with. And to put that in, if you only have this much clearance between the, you know, the ground and the house, it just doesn't work. So ductless mini splits help. Um, typically more efficient. And they're hyperheat units, as I discussed, that can heat a room as little as five minutes. Also, there's a remote, so just like with the TV, you have the remote for the ductless mini split, and you can carry it around with you wherever you're at. So if you're in a room and there's different parts of a larger room, you can just kind of go and set it down and tight, and the air, the cassette air handler will actually realize where you're at and will direct inner heat in your direction. So over here in the part of the room, it might be a little cooler, and of course you can blend it, so it just varies. Some of the cons. So if air handlers, which are the heads, are not placed in every room, it can create noticeable temperature and dehumidification gradients. So bathrooms, yes sir. Well, this is something you might want to add in, in what happens, especially with Sear. Sure. Because I experienced it in Charlotte, and they created a monster. We went from an old, when the heat pump was broke down, went to the highest rating we could possibly get, and it ended up with flooding water in the, in the crawl space because of the uh, air handler wasn't designed to handle that much. Uh, it was like setting a glass of oh, sure, ice yeah. water on a counter. Yeah. It just sweated like crazy, and it created a problem. So a lot of these older systems have older air, air handling systems that aren't insulated. And so you put a high efficiency on an old air handling system, you've got a different problem now. You're, depending on where that is, it may be mold, it may be the structure of your drywall, or it just may be making a puddle yeah. really big under your house. Well, you know, my you're getting estimates through the years that I've queried, you know, because I always like to save money. And if I see that a unit is bad, not necessarily the whole system, and I've queried of HVAC, HVAC installers, can you just change this out? To a man, every one of them has said no. We will change out the whole system. It doesn't matter if the furnace is working or the air handler is working. They're going to put in an entire system, absent duct work. Duct, 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 duct work might stay. So, um, yeah, I mean, any, any system, as I understand it, not being an HVA system, but having gotten so many uh, quotes, is that if they install one piece, they're going to install the other piece too. Well, they, they don't always do that. Yeah, well, that's a I had, yeah. I had, mine was a ring, mine was from one of the highest rating dealers in Charlotte, yeah. and they never suggested anything about the air handling under the house. Yeah. So, it's just be aware yeah. of that if you do it. It's worth it if you can, can also afford it. Yeah, and, and that just brings you know to like another question. Uh, I mean, another issue, which is when you're dealing with the trades, right? It's always kind of it's like anything in life. It's buyer beware. You want to really get a full understanding. I'm not suggesting you're dead. I'm just saying there's always a risk. Uh, 
And, and unfortunately, most of the trades operate in silos. So if you go to do something, they'll say, uh, well, I don't know anything about that, but this is what we can do. They're not, when they're thinking of energy efficiency, they might only be thinking of their particular area, but they can't think of the whole house as, you know, just sort of picking up on things like water heaters, et cetera. Um, All right. Okay, so just the last piece here is the, the more heads that you add to any particular condenser outside, the, the, the less efficiency there is. It's just, it's just a, a mathematical thing. So if you had a 30 C or heat uh, ductless mini split, that might drop it down to C or 20 or something if you added multiple heads. But that's still really, really efficient. Okay, that's all I've, I think we'll break now. It's been an hour. Yes, sir. I have a question about uh, selling solar energy back to the electric companies. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I investigated solar, and the town of Waynesville told me they would not buy back mm -hmm. excess. And what's the status of that now? I can talk. Well, I'll be glad to talk with you. I think we'll take a break. We're gonna okay. we're gonna do the big solar piece next time. So I'll be glad to just while we take a break. Answer Thank your you. Okay, so this is the second part of the program. We've discussed so far lighting, water heating, and HVAC, and those are kind of the three big ones. I also want to talk about, though briefly, some other things that might seem self-explanatory. Uh, we're going to talk about insulation, appliances, greenscaping, not to be confused with greenwashing, which is bad, <laughs> and behavior. So, okay, insulation and re-insulation. So, uh, this is from the Department of Energy's website, I'll read it. An insulating material's resistance to conductive heat flow is measured or rated in terms of its thermal resistance or R value. The higher the R value, the greater the insulating effectiveness. The R value depends on the type of insulation, its thickness and its density. The R value of most insulations also depends on temperature, aging, moisture accumulation. When calculating the R value of a multi-layer insulation, add the R value is on today. Okay, so if you have a home and you've not been in your attic space for some amount of time, maybe years, um, you will discover that if you have a lower, or not, not, you don't have less insulation, your insulation has become compacted over time. Moisture can cause this, etc. And when insulation goes down like so, it becomes less efficient. Right? This fluffy stuff, this fiberglass, bats, and etc. that you see at Lowe's, the reason you know you cut it up and it just <laughs> it just pops open, that's what it's supposed to do, maintain this level of, depending on the R value, 12, 15 inches. And that provides a barrier to prevent heat getting out. So if you have an old home, chances are pretty good. If you've ever torn out insulation, you'll see it's like this. It looks like a, a club sandwich that's been smushed <laughs> together. And that is really inefficient. The home in Charlotte, home in Asheville, mom's house, our house in Asheville. We went through and had to re-insulate. It's, it's, it's not hard to do, it's no fun to do. That's for certain. And you wanna make sure if you attempt this, that you do it at a time of year where the temperature is reasonable in an attic space. I did our one in Charlotte in May of some year. I had a buddy suit on, a respirator, and I thought I was gonna die because it must have been 125 degrees in the attic. So you wanna pick when you do it, clearly. Um, Re-insulating the house is very important because heat goes up. And in this area of the world, here in West North Carolina, you know, heat rises, so if you have an attic space that's not well insulated, it's just venting into space, and you're gonna use a lot more energy. So this is yet another thing to be done. It's not an appliance, it's not a system. It is a measure to help protect the envelope of your home from heat loss, um, also underneath your house. Um, inspect your house from time to time. You might notice typically there are, there are uh, rolls or bats put up and there's pins. and those pins can fall down, you can have insulation that droops. <coughs> that's not good either. So that's a little bit about insulation. Insulation is very self-explanatory, I think. When you go into a place like Lowe's or Home Depot, they typically have an end cap and they'll have everything on it. It'll tell you where your region is, what your specified insulation or R value is. And it'll be like R36, or R30, and then you buy it, you go home, you install it, or you have someone else install it. Importantly, um, 
it's important you know, because you, you, you can definitely itch. That's just a sort of a, you know, from fiberglass installation, but you also don't want to inhale it. So you want to make sure that with microparticles you're wearing a respirator to install it. That's not a picture of me, but it looks a little like me. Okay, that's all. That's all. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as insulation goes, say say you look at your attic and the insulation has has shrunk. Is it feasible to just lay over new insulation over the old? You can add R values. <coughs> you can add R values. I'm not a professional in this. I would submit though. I would I would suppose that you could add insulation on top of it because then whatever you know this insulation if it was R30 and now it's compacted it's not R30. Whatever you put on top of it, though, you know, you want to make sure you edit. Now, of course, you've got to be very careful about the moisture content of the insulation that you, that you left behind. If it's a high moisture content, uh, it's compacted more, and you are going to drop dramatically. You need to get rid of it. Okay. Yeah, I, like yeah. Yeah, I was going to also suggest that in addition to insulation, there are other components that go in on with it that are equally or perhaps even more poor putting an air barrier to stop infiltration and exfiltration and uh, moisture control. Uh, it's, it's a complicated area of the building and insulation is just one, one small piece of that. Yes? How efficient is the blown in insulation? We have that from it's, as, it's as efficient as, as, you, as you pile it, right? It has an R value too, so it's just, it's apples apples and apples, depending on how, how you stack it. You can get the cellulose blown in insulation or fiberglass blown in insulation. Uh, you know, you know, and here's the thing too, I, you know, I, I'd like to, I wish I had more time, I could talk about doors and windows too. We could talk about doors, uh, new doors, making sure that they fit right, that they're not cracks where, where wind blows in our house. We live in a house built in 1908, it's got some of those issues that we need to address. Windows are important. When we lived in Asheville, we had a big bay window that had a crack in it. I put my hand up, but then about six inches of the single pane window and feel the cold. $2,300 later, we got replaced with a low E or low emissivity, argon filled, double pane glass. And you can put your hand on it. Still cool, but it wasn't, you weren't feeling that kind of. So the thing with doors and windows too is that, you know, low emissivity, argon filled, uh, windows don't cost appreciably more. It's not like you're taking it to the stratosphere if you choose to get those types of windows. And they're also available places like Lowe's or Window World. Um, but always looking at, you know, d definitely looking at, we're not, you know, kind of more time we would talk about um, getting all of those spaces, in, you know, think of the great stuff, right? The stuff at Lowe's and caulking and making sure that all of those uh, spaces are trimmed down around windows and doors. But on to appliances. So the good news about today's appliances that you might find in a store is that they're very efficient by historical standards, right? You'll see the Energy Star Guide in there. You get some kind of range of dishwasher. It uses 30 to $36 worth of energy a year. They're all pretty similar. There's no real like energy hog when it comes to any of these sort of kitchen appliances anymore. They're pretty efficient. Um, but the bad news is still, and I saw this in an article the other day, is that in the developing world, people use less energy a year per capita than an American's refrigerator. Think about your refrigerator, it might be, what, $95 worth of energy a year? So one of the developing world is using less than that. So as we think about ways to make change, we also need to think about our responsibility as a first world people, that our energy is well beyond what any of these people are, are using, and yet they are the ones who are going to experience the worst of climate change, because most of these people live in between the tropics or the climates or, or the global south. And another issue to consider too is we need to make ever better increases in these technologies, because these people in these other parts of the world aspire to be middle class one day too, whatever middle class looks like in their country. So having refrigerators will be part of their lives as the century progresses. Um, so if you have old appliances, though, this is, a, this is an area of concern. Uh, I did a sort of an energy audit walkthrough at Montmorency United Methodist Church in Canada. I used to go there when we lived in Asheville. And we walked through, we did a food program. So we froze a lot of food. We have dinners for people, you know, 100 people a night or more. Um, we 
also did a Mana Food Bank. So there was a lot of storage going on in that fellowship hall, and it felt like a room full of computer servers. It was so hot because these old, inefficient deep freezers. And so I'd pull up, and I actually had to just get the, the numbers off of the different models and go back and research it. And some of them were using as much as $400 a year to, to, to freeze food, which is ridiculous because modern freezers are very efficient. So importantly, if you do have like the water heater, one of these things that just does its job and you've forgotten about it, how much energy it uses, it might be one of these things that's not doing you any favors at all, like an old deep freezer. Okay, so just again about appliances. I know everybody, you know, whenever you see a sort of a gourmet kitchen, it always features some kind of gas stove, wolf range. I get it, I'm not hating on people, we have one too. But we very much don't want it. We want to get away from that. If you can avoid putting fossil fuels in your kitchen, it's better. There are induction cooktops nowadays that will heat water faster than gas, and they're all electric. So, you know, that's, that's the way to go. So try to avoid, if possible. And also, just from a health perspective, there's, there's new data to show that there are sort of these micro emissions within a house that can cause health problems that, you, you know, your, your, your alarm's never going to pick up on. You're not going to necessarily smell that these are potentially bleaching into the homes. Okay. Uh, and the same, thing's, so the same thing's true with appliances. We can buy washers and dryers. I mean, all of them, they're pretty efficient nowadays. It's how you use them really that will make a difference. Okay, I want to talk a little about greenscaping, not greenwashing. Remember, greenwashing is what you do when you aren't really doing something that's good for the environment. You just tell people you are. Like if you're a Fortune 500 company and you say something like, we're working towards net zero, really when? Right, because that's the new disinformation. We don't have, we, we don't really have a deadline. We're gonna get there sometime. So just always be thinking when you watch commercials about how truly committed companies are to achieving decarbonization. But greenscaping on the other, on the, on the other hand is you know, a landscaping practice to enable less intensive maintenance on one's lawn, shrubs, and that's a scrubs. I've been at the hospital, but it's just a shrubs, shrubs and trees while using species to support lower energy requirements for the interior of one's home. So it's kind of taking the energy efficiency thing also out into the outdoors. So we live at about 35 degrees latitude in the northern hemisphere, and wind often blows out of the north in the winter. And so what you would like to do ideally in a home if you're designing a yard is you would like to have some kind of screen on the north side of the house, maybe evergreens, uh, and same thing with shrubs, in order to prevent that windbreak from reaching the house fully in the winter. Anyone who's ever driven across country, you see this plenty in places like Kansas and Nebraska because the wind just howls, and folks who live on ranches and farms will put up uh, windscreens. Uh, another important uh, thing to consider here with respect to trees is passive solar heating. So, Good example, our house in Waynesville, we have two giant billowy white oak trees, just gorgeous. And they provide a lot of shade in the summer. And that's great, because that means we don't have to cool the house like we would if we lived down in Hazelwood somewhere with no trees. So we have these giant trees, and they provide a lot of shade, which is good, because we don't have to pay more to cool the home. The good thing about these trees, though, is that in the fall, they drop their leaves. And then we get passive solar light, they're still branching, et cetera, but we get passive solar onto our house, which heats up the house so that we use less heat, less, less fuel to heat. So if you can design a home with those things in mind, shade is very important. Okay, uh, trees are also important, why, and then shrubs, et cetera, because they sequester carbon. And if you properly place trees in the summer, it'll allow them to pass away. Okay. Any questions about greenscaping? Yeah. Okay, so also talking about tree canopy. So there's some interesting information here. It's not just your home, also think about the place where you live in Waynesville, right? Asheville's experienced significant growth. <coughs> People will build a house anywhere, I've seen it. We go eat dinner there, and I think that used to be a ditch. And now it's got a house. And they poured thousands of tons of concrete. They built a house there and sold it for half a million dollars. Uh, so, Here's the problem with land in the world. Land has no value except in as much as it can be exploited. And that's the shame, right? We don't really, not say we don't, but you know, as, as a species, we, we just look at a piece of land, I got some land, I'll sell
sell it, or I'll build a house on it and sell it. And we just keep deforesting. So this is particularly true in cities. So um, you might have heard about this. It was in the news a, a lot. But um, uh, in Baltimore, neighborhoods with no trees, and I've been to this someplace. If you ever watch The Wire on HBO, you know what I'm talking about, these tenant housing, right? Uh, neighborhoods with no trees in the summer have temperatures recorded 10 to 16 degrees hotter than trees, in, uh, than, excuse me, than homes just down the street in a tree lined area. That is the benefit of trees. And it's also important because if you think of um, a neighborhood from a bird's eye view, what do you have? You have asphalt shingles on a roof, you have a concrete or an asphalt driveway, then you have an asphalt road. And it just, because my mom's house in Charlotte, I think about that because it's like 110 degrees every time I go there. And it just cooks and it radiates. And the trees, you know, they take that in, it's cool underneath. But if you don't have trees, then it just cooks everything. And it makes the ground hard, it makes the grass not grow. And you end up with this positive feedback cycle that's not good. You have more drying out, you have more erosion when it does rain. Because the area just doesn't get cool. So at night in Charlotte, you walk outside, what is it, 84 degrees at midnight? Because the, the asphalt is still radiating all that heat. So trees are very important. Uh, also, St. Asheville, in a 10-year period, lost 6.4% of its tree cover. And that was until 2018. I can tell you it's a lot worse now. It's gotta be. So, you know, as a community, we need to think about trees and the preservation of this, of, of, of having that in our town, of having requirements, and, and not just for some tree that's grown in like a, I'm sorry, an Easter red bud. An Easter red bud is not an appropriate planting for, to, to shade a parking lot, right? It grows like 15 feet tall and it lives 15 years. We need, you know, bigger trees, bigger trees. Oh. Oaks, acorns not standing yet. Okay, the last thing we'll talk about today in this energy efficiency module is the thing that is the cheapest to change and yet the hardest. Because behavior connotes a pattern of actions that are habitual and often unconscious. I'll give you another example. My mother. I've lived with my mother for a significant period of my life. My mother turns on every light in the house. She's one of those people that has every light in the house on. <clears throat> so when I bought the house floor and I started making upgrades in Charlotte, I went through and I put an LED in every single light socket because I knew she would do that. And not only that, I didn't give her a 60 watt equivalent, I gave her a 40 watt equivalent. <laughs> she was gonna have them all on anyway, so it doesn't really matter. She still has enough light. So that's the thing, behavior. And the reason I have a picture of someone running here, stock photo, is because, you know, I tried running. I'll probably run from a wild animal or something. I might even try to run tonight during that downtown mile thing, but I just can't get into running. It takes, and I talk to people who run, they say, well, how is it you run all the time? I say, well, the first six months I did it, I hated it every single day. And then it became something that I just did, right? So behavioral, uh, excuse me, behavior is intentional. It takes practice and it takes commitment. So think of things you might do in your home. Turning off lights, obviously one. Also, you can put lights on timers, right? If it's summertime and you need to get up the staircase, put on a timer and have the thing come on whatever at 8 o'clock at night, turn off at 11, that's the time you go to bed. That way you don't have to fool with turning lights on and off. You can actually have technology take care of it for you. You can also use smart systems within your home to do that. Um, Drying clothes outside, that to me is just such a no-brainer. I don't know why Americans don't do that. I, I just, you go to Europe, you drive around in Rome, and everyone has their laundry outside, because it's so obvious. And interestingly, you know, I've tried it in every kind of weather here, and as long as it's warmer than freezing, it could be 34 degrees, your clothes will still dry. It will just take longer. And then if they're cold and you kind of can't tell the difference, you can always come in the house and throw them in the dryer for 15 minutes. And 15 minutes is better than an hour. It's a good clothesline. Or have, you know, decorative lights, you know, like for a party. That's what we do, we just throw them up. <laughs> okay, washing clothes in cold water. Again, remember, I'm paying $800 a year, unfortunately, for propane, so I don't try to use hot water if I can help it. We'll wash clothes in cold water. 
there's ionizing, there's different kinds. So there's all kinds of things nowadays that you really, you don't need to just throw it into the hot water to get rid of all germs. Um, bedding, not just bedding excluded. Um, another thing you can do is analyze your utility bill each month. Now, a wasteful that won't get you very far because it just it used to come on a postcard, and on the top of the postcard it said, thinking of you. <laughs> I always thought that was bizarre. <laughs> but in Waitsville now, you get a letter, and the letter just says, here's your energy usage for the month. Here is uh, your water, here's your uh, sewer, if you have sewer, and here's your recycling, and here's your tax, and that's your bill, and please come pay. If you have Duke, you can have more elegant, or not el more elegant, but probably much, it's, it's, not, it's, it's elegant, but it's much more involved type of assessment. I have on my, I can spy on my mother in Charlotte because I can pull up energy usage by the day. So I can look at our energy usage every single day so I can, I can wrap mom on the knuckles from afar for not plugging in her plug-in hybrid. You didn't, you didn't plug in the car again, did you? I didn't go anywhere today. I guess you did because I saw that too. So, so, but she had this real granular um, ability to figure out how you're using energy. Now, it's not necessarily at the source per se, but when I plug in an electric car, when I go visit mom, and I plug in our RAV4 Prime, which gets 50 miles or so of electric range, then I know when I've been there, because it goes like this. It spikes up quite a lot. And that's OK, because still, electricity is cheaper than gas, even under normal gas prices. Uh, so if you have the ability to get in that, if you have an online account with Duke, Duke Energy, Duke Progress, I don't know what Haywood AMCs looks like, but I know that Wayne is about as basic as you can get. Uh, but there, there are opportunities there to kind of look at your usage. You can look at it on a, on a, on a daily basis, a month-by-month -month basis. You can look at it compared to this month, last year. You have all kinds of opportunities there. Okay, um, other things. You can turn down your thermostat, save money, or turn it up, depending on if it's winter or summer. I mean, that's something I really don't do, I'll be honest with you, because I like it, the temperature, I like it. But there are smart devices, right? There's the Nest thermostats, smart thermostats. The one I showed you earlier of our house, we have an eco, uh, E Econet from Bream, and so I'm, it's Wi-Fi connected. So I'm able to, if I want to turn off the water heater, or turn off, or turn down the air, or turn up the air, I can do all those things remotely, which I really find valuable. Uh, and then the last one, uh, we, we do this because, uh, like I said, we have pretty generous shading most of the day. Is that at night in the summer, we throw up in our windows. And then I get home, and then I wake up in the morning, I set my alarm, and I close all the windows. And usually that'll get us to about 3 or 4 in the afternoon, and I might have to turn on the AC for a couple hours. So I'm just thinking of ways that behavior, and if, you know, I'm sorry, you know, probably nobody here has like a 14-year-old, you know, but if you have teenagers, for those households that have teenagers, um, okay, for the households that have teenagers, you know, that, that could be a, a, the behavior part can be a, a, a harder discussion to have, right? <laughs> they take long showers, they play video games, they use a lot of energy. But um, that's it, just like going through the house and every person in the house kind of having a responsibility and uh, trying to use the cheapest thing possible to create energy. Well, that's all I've got for this month. So I'll take any questions you might have. If Anybody want to get you? I find it really uh, easy to do blinds at night in the morning, winter and summer. Yeah, it's only pull up. It takes about a minute and a half to go through. It's done. Right. Yeah, the passive solar heating that can come in the, in the, in the winter time. But the other question is Does your mom still send you Christmas greetings? <laughs> she, yeah, she, birthday cards. she comes up and says, Well, you know, the thing is, so a couple of years ago, I, I paid Tesla. $16,400 to put a solar panel system on the house. And then she said, you know what I want for Christmas? Uh -huh. And I was like, Mom, I, I know what you got for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> $16,400 to solar panel. No, we're good we're, 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 we're buds. Yeah. Um, I'll go first. Um, electricity is, I know you can create it on water, but it's also coal fire, and that's a fossil fuel. How do you get off saying that electricity is so much better than propane gas? Okay, sure. Um, because I believe, I'm hopeful, that the grid will get to where it needs to get. And what that means is, I mean, like this morning, I just heard an NPR article that there is a power plant outside of Portland that is, is powering 500,000 homes, I believe it was, 355,000 homes, with wind, solar, and battery storage. So here's the thing about that. So folks will say, well, 
you know, I've been over to Ingalls and somebody snarkily put on the, on the, on the, on the car charger, powered by coal. And, you know, okay, yeah, I can't do anything about that. Yeah. You know, you can only, it's your locus of control. What can you control? So with respect to propane, and um, there, are, there are technologies. I'm not saying they're super affordable for everybody, that everybody can dump out money. I feel like I make decent money. And it took us six years to get a house that is 1,300 square feet in Nashville to net zero. And some of that was COVID, because it had overtime. You know? And so it, I understand it's a challenge, but that's why I think as a community too, we need to start thinking of this is gonna be a couple, two, three year process of trying to get the, the Waynesville's utility, for instance, to be more than a pass-through to the general fund. It needs to access federal programs, USDA grants and loans, in order to then relend that money out to the community to create savings. So I think there are real opportunities there. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? It's fine, thank you. Yes, sir. Are these lines available online? I can make them available. Okay. I can do that. I think this, uh, we recording this, it's gonna be on our church YouTube channel. It's being recorded. It is being recorded, recorded, but if you'd like us, the slides and so on. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice. Can you talk next time about the federal programs that might assist people to install solar energy or buy the vehicles or municipalities and county governments to produce solar energy? Yes. Um, you know, the next module is on renewable energy with solar. We're going to talk about, and it's going to be, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be a little complicated because somebody's going to have Duke Progress, somebody's got Duke Energy, somebody's got Town of Wainsville, somebody's got Hayway and C. And those are all different tariffs or solar schedules. So we're going to sort of pick at each one of those and talk about them. The Wainsville one is still being developed somewhat, I think. We're having a meeting this Thursday. Um, and here we'll talk about incentives as well. You know, I, th there are opportunities, as, as we discussed in our, in our meetings, to have the Climate Action Coalition work to create an environmental sustainability board, which is a citizen's advisory board, that way it's sanctioned, and then it moves forward and maybe takes some of what could be the potential workload of the town off, its, off of it, so that we can concentrate on some of those things and partner with other ESDs throughout the state and the country to, to, to really drive change. And that's gonna be a multi-pronged process. And we'll also talk about the tax credits, because you know, the, the tax credits, just briefly, if you're, if you're wanting to install solar, it's 26% this year, next year it's 22%, then it goes bye-bye. It's going the wrong way, isn't it? Yeah, well, of course, Congress can always act, and sometimes they do. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to extend it, it could be part of some compromise omnibus bill or something like that. But I always just say, as it stands, you know, as it stands, if you install solar this year and it's commissioned before the end of the year, you get a 26% tax credit, and then next year it's 22, and then it sunsets entirely. So we'll see how that goes. With respect to electric vehicles, that's very dependent on the manufacturer. If you're a GM or a Tesla owner, you get no tax credits because they've already met the 200,000 vehicle limit, and that has sunset. If you're a Toyota owner, they haven't sold a fully electric vehicle yet, but because of all the plug-in hybrids, they have our, they're going to reach the 200,000 vehicle mark somewhere this month, and then that would start to sunset. So Congress could change things for those legacy auto manufacturers. Tesla says they don't want them. We don't need them. And that's a little bravado from Elon Musk. It's, that's how he is. He's mercurial. Um, but yeah, there's the tax credits, and then I think we really need to think about um, Charging, you know, John and I are going to a conference. We're going to try to bring back ideas. I've contacted Tesla. They didn't reach back out just yet. You know, you just got to keep calling people. Mm -hmm. Rivian, Electrify America. It would be great if Waynesville had stuff here because what we know is that when people come to charge, they get out and explore. And then they have it on their phone. Honey, we're at 56%. What do you want to do? Let's get an ice cream. Mm -hmm. So you linger. When you linger, you spend more money. When you spend more money, the businesses get more money. And this, the town gets more tax receipts. So it's a win, 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 win. See? Just real quick, because I know we're running out of time. Yes. Thank you so much. It's so interesting. But uh, and you just brought up three things that make you feel like electoral politics are still so important for these issues. But I want to ask uh, Kevin, you know, we're talking about um, many people in this county have wells and water based um, heat pumps. 
you know, because below the surface, water stays at 50 degrees. Maybe, Kevin, maybe you could talk about that a little bit, you being an engineer. Well, well the experience in our house, we, we have ground floor sitting on it. And we have water from the well. So we just have tap off the wells out of the water system in the house after the pressure tank, after the well first, pass through the heat pump, dump it out the daylight on the ground. And that's how we get from the heat pump. So uh, as opposed to say Bethlehem Memory, which has about a hundred wells, 450 feet, and a closely system with uh, ethanol water-based solution. So there, there are different ways to do that. If you're, if you're in a house and you have a well, if you're building a house and you're in a bunch of well, geothermal is, is a very uh, attractive one. How, how, uh, find, I mean, since the well's already going in, right? right. That's the cost right. associated with the well, so that's the cost avoided mm -hmm. in just driving, yes. and doing the exactly. geothermal there. Okay. And then, then the heat pump itself, there's a little premium for a uh, extended range temperature water source heat pump, but uh, compare that to say uh, a 20 seater fairly free flow ductless. Because I've had most of the new housing being built in Haywood County have wells. They're outside town limits. So an awful lot of houses are being built. People can afford it by land outside the city limits. This would be a real positive thing. It brings your attention to builders. I was also going to make another point to, to Pat's question. I was Doing some research, I'm teaching a class this fall at the Moore Ryan and there's a sustainability studies program. Uh, if you look at electrical generation yes, right now, it's a it's a five-piece pile. It's 20% coal, 20% uh, nuclear, 20% renewables, including hydro, and about 40% natural gas. In 1990, that pie would have been about 55% coal. Mm -hmm. so, so the trends continue in the right direction. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the cost, the cost of the, the cost of uh, you know, per mm -hmm. gigawatt created, let's say, from an energy source, is is so much less than it used to be with renewable. Right? I mean, the, the wind turbines coming out now. I mean, I've seen 13 megawatt wind turbines. These are monstrous. You can see them from space almost. And, and the offshore capability. So, as you may or may not know, there's you know, off of Wilmington, Duke Energy and another company have acquired uh, space to create offshore wind, which will, will provide the Northeast, the Mid Atlantic, mm -hmm. offshore wind. We're, we're kind of late to the game. Europe has been on the forefront for quite a while when it comes to wind, especially the Dutch. Go figure. Um, well, well. The other side of that is Iowa, about 60% of Iowa's electricity is from there. Right, they actually shuttered, they shuttered a nuclear plant early right. because of its wind generation. Wind generation. And my brother is a geotechnical engineer and does deep foundations for um, for wind turbines, among other things. And so he's that's his territory. He's got like 18 states and he's often out there. And just, you know, it, it's perfectly awesome because you have cows and then you have extra rents so to speak, that are created for the farmers because of uh, winter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, when you talk about advocacy, do you, have a, do you have a section in your presentation about that? About how do we encourage our representatives to do things that are in you know, our favor? I do not, and I should. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I very much operate on the basis, this is just me personally, I very much operate on the basis that every, all politics is very local, right? And so, many of us are trying to, to get things going here in Waynesville, and, and me, personally, I just kind of stopped there, you know, because I could I could contact Madison Coughlin's office, and if somebody would give me the number or the email address, because last time I checked, he didn't have either of those. Uh, I, I do write Tom Tillis once a week, and I can't about any number of issues, could be Russia, could be fossil fuels, could, you know, any number of issues. Um, 
and I, and I know Green Gold Alliance, the Sierra Club, there are other larger organizations that folks can then participate in. I'm going to see Bill McKibben this next week at the Collider in downtown Asheville. That should be awesome. You know, so, um, but my, because I work nights at the VA and my time, I just never know if I'm coming or going. When I have time, I just find myself trying to just reach out locally and get small things done here. Because there's so much potential in Waynesville. The, the golden goose for Waynesville is its utility. It has its own utility, right? Which means it's run by the governing board. So to create change, doesn't matter how hard it is, it's gonna be a lot easier than to, 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 to call it the dukes of the world. Where I have to go with the Sierra Club and say, well, no, we object to this, and we wanna go with the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I, I think all those things are good. I just, I've really concentrated on Waynesville as um, being a place that can really have electric vehicles, have solar, and be deployed in so many more places. Not a fiction, because we all have to get there. You know, it doesn't matter if the Hype household rocks it out in Asheville, because my neighbors haven't done that. You know, so everyone's got to get there. There are bills in front of our legislature that relate to the environment or climate, and so one thing we could do is do a brief summation at one of the next two energy efficiency seminars, because it's an election year. Yeah. And then if you will see who's sponsoring what, and you know, who's got this in their in their sites, I think that's helpful. We do also have postcards on the table outside that are already addressed to Tom Phillips. So we encourage you to write down your concerns and pop it in the mail to him. Any more questions? Any questions online? I just have a question. Oh, sure. I yes, noticed that there's an Episcopalian uh, action network for legislation. And I know that when I use that network, I get a response from the representative. So when I use something like the Sierra Club, they don't even get a response. Uh, okay, yeah. So you can tie it in with something that doesn't maybe seem issue specific. Right. What's the name of that site again? It's the Episcopal Church of the United States. So right. you go there, there's an action network. You find it really easy. But they do environmental concerns. And, you know, it's a big social issue. Yeah, right. Yeah. And there is also a new app called Climate Action Now. And you can get it for free. Download it on your iPhone. Um, it's just come out in the past, I think, seven or eight months. And they do have lots of good up-to-date um, information. They will not blast you with a lot of stuff um, about these issues, advocacy and, and so forth. And they have a pretty interesting strategy leading into the elections so, about climate issues and stuff. Uh, Nick, 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 do we have any questions online? No questions online right now. Right. Yes, sir. There's something about uh, smart thermostats. Uh, I highly recommend However, the smart S thermostat is necessarily compatible with every system out there. Some manufacturer has their own smart thermostat. So don't buy the S and then find out it's not compatible with the smart thermostat. That's true with a lot of them. Yeah. We have, we have the Econet, uh, which is a ream specific. I think Train probably has its own kind of specific thing. The higher end models, they're going to throw it. We have a Lennox uh, XC25 in Charlotte. And it comes with its own iPad, right? And so, yeah, you do have to kind of figure out. I think the Nest worked better with like single stage and dual stage lower end models where you're just tri tri changing it out for a honey level or something. Yeah. yeah. I learned a lot from what you were saying. Well, thank you for that, William. A um, number of things you're mentioning are applicable to possibilities for our new climate uh, 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 conservation core, like changing out light bulbs. If we if anyone have an idea how we could promote that, or warm up the community in terms of how we can actually go in the homes with you to supervise my adults right. to do that, that could be cool. I mean, really a cool idea that, that you threw up today. Many of them. Jim? 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 I made a recent there's comment some legal around with energy savings Asheville that may have an avenue. Thank you. Go ahead, Ed. There's some legal ramifications of this have to be careful because if we go into someone's home, we wind up being responsible for all of the uh, valuables or whatever sure. on their work. But I do think it's a good idea. It's something I tried to start when I first came here with the baby case of energy. The free energy surveys for lots of these homes can go in. And at that time, it was still the lucky, still is, to 
change that light bulb and basically seal holes and do things that's going to improve their energy efficiency within the home, especially in, in the poor homes and trails and so forth. And where I got the push back was on the legal thing. And so we would like to see, I would like to be able to see that run up again and have help determining what we can do to bypassing the legal All right, well, I guess I think we're going to wrap up now, folks. Thank you for joining. Uh, yes, we got one more. Uh, what, do, one more thing. I got one more question. Oh, you got one question? Sure. Um, Pam asks, I have an old propane heat pump. Before it fails, I would like to replace it. How difficult would it be to change from propane to a heat pump water heater? We're talking water heater. Yes. From propane to the heat pump water heater. But you have to have space in your panel. Uh, it's going to take a 30 amp five volt breaker. Um, basically, it would be a plumber coming out, turning off the propane as the source, and then you're just plumbing into the uh, tanked heat pump water heater. And then you have to run an electrical supply line over to the electric service, and you have to make sure that you have 30 amps available in your panel which historically, uh, a lot of homes, that was just part of it. You had at least the water heater connection in there. So search the panel or have an expert search the panel to make sure there's available, um, amperage available in the service panel. And then it's just a matter of uh, a plumber coming out and doing it. Now I will say this about the trades though, okay? I will say this about the trades, not hating on trades. I just want everyone to understand one thing about the trades. The trades, builders, etc., they're used to doing what they always do. What's familiar to them is what they're going to recommend, and that's just the way it is, because that's what they do. A builder, if you ask the builder what kind of home are you going to build, they're going to listen to uh, prospective homeowners. I want an open floor plan, I want granite countertops, I want a nice bathroom, hardwood floors. That's what I want. Nobody said anything about a high efficiency heat pump, a heat pump water heater, LED lights throughout the home, et cetera, or solar, or a car charger, or stubbing up for that in a garage or outside of the house. So the thing about this plot, the spot where trades are right now, you work all day. You're out in the elements. You go home, you want to forget work. That's just the way, you know, they have to do continuing education. But the, thing, the great thing about a heat pump water heater is it hooks up just like a regular water heater. It just, a plumber can do it, it's easy. The only caveat there, as I mentioned earlier, is you have to have some exchangeable space for air. So you have to know where you're doing. That's that. Okay, so I want to thank everybody, and I want to encourage you, uh, July 16th, we're going to talk about solar energy. I think that kind of takes it to the next step because we've done the building blocks of energy efficiency. So solar, we're going to talk about the installation, I'll hopefully have someone here that's NAPSEP certified, that's North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners here, uh, and I'll be speaking to uh, size of systems, how to size out a system, um, incentives that currently exist, like the 26% tax credit, what might also be involved in the 26% tax credit, like if you have to upgrade your electric panel, that can be included, as long as it's done around the same time, the same calendar year. Um, so solar, yeah, we're going to talk solar. We'll talk a little bit too about micro hydroelectric maybe and wind turbines, but you just got to understand that unless you live on the coast in North Carolina or at Grandfather Mountain, there really is not much wind resource here. The maps just don't show. My uncle has a house in the waterway near Swansboro. The trees grow like this <laughs> because the wind just howls all the time. So a breeze is not sufficient to generate um, electricity through wind turbines, you have to have a robust source of wind. So we're mostly going to talk about solar, that's on July 16th. And then on August 13th, we're going to have the Blue Ridge EV Car Club here with Teslas and maybe even try to get a Rivian out here, some of these newer cars. The knock on electric cars historically has been, it's key, right? Because the batteries cost so much, you have to put them in a small footprint of a car and the car's not well trimmed out. The cost of batteries, notwithstanding inflation and supply chain, has fallen dramatically, and now the manufacturers are putting batteries in their best cars. And they're still expensive, but Chevy promises there'll be the electric blazer at $30,000. Right? There, there are cars coming out that are going to be more affordable. So, very excited for that day. We're talking about charging 
infrastructure in town and possibilities, as well as the ability to get in, put fingerprints on, and sit inside some of these EVs. That's on August 13th. Okay, uh oh, well, I don't know about that. I could get a Ford Mach E Mustang here. Like, I know I can do that because I've already talked to him. Put Friendly. in your request now. He'll make sure it's paid for the portion I'll try to get us a Lucid if I can. That's a that's really neat car, too. So, anyways, thank you all. I appreciate it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>